Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Dear Hector, have you ever had the feeling that you're being followed? I'm sure I've seen that guy somewhere before. The one in the stripy shirt carrying guitar. I think he was on New Faces playing Apache. Anyway, never mind about that. This, dear Hector, is Malaga, an exciting city full of Baroque and Moorish architecture, sliced into bite-sized chunks by little winding streets and alleyways. A delicious place. The air is full of cooking smells, olive oil and sardines. Anyway, this city, the birthplace of Pablo Picasso, incidentally, is the gateway to the Costa del Sol. But as you know, I like to think of myself as not just a cook, but as a gastronomic detective. And building stars can give a solid impression of the color influences of a place. finger work, great phrasing. He plays as though he really understands the feeling and true spirit of the music. If he carries on like this, I might invite him down to the pub to play. You have to help these people, you know. He might be famous one day, like the Stranglers. These men are fishing for bocaroonies, tiny fish they dust with seasoned flour and fry quickly in virgin olive oil. In a scene unchanged since biblical times, they lower their nets to catch the small fish that come inshore to feed during the night. Sardines, anchovies and mullet are the prize. And while the Mediterranean sun is still weak and the tourists are nursing their hangovers, they are busy trying their luck against the sea. It's not because they need to. They make most of their money by hiring out sunbeds, running bars and selling ice creams. But before the tourists came, it was an essential part of their lives, a part they refused to let go, and more straight their elbow, too. Well, there it is. As so often happens on the Floyd programmes, we shoot our nets and catch absolutely nothing. As the good Lord said, cast your bread on the waters and you shall get back soggy bread. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, there is no fish, but instead I'll cook a gazpacho, which is really the signature dish of Andalusia. Soon, the beach here at Tormelinas is full. The best places are taken, and the serious business of getting a tan starts. Nearest to the sea, of course, the Germans, and then the Dutch, and finally by the bar, the English. But being a busy, enterprising young chef, well, middle-aged, actually, it's time for Andalusian cooking sketch numero uno. Uh, Clive, if you could tear yourself away from these tomatoes, I want to explain to you exactly what I'm doing here. It's a dish, it's a wonderful, important dish from Andalusia involving tomatoes, peppers, olive oil, things like that. And it's called gazpacho. It's an iced soup. It's salad in a glass. It's a liquid salad. It's a soup very often abused by people because they don't really understand what it is. Sometimes they make it with just tomato juice and throw a few things into it. But in fact, there's more to it than that. It doesn't actually need cooking, but it does need happy, very happy, very fresh tomatoes. So let's have a whirl around the ingredients. You see, this is a, a happy tomato in its original state. And uh, let me just tell about the happy tomatoes because one of the funny things of making programs about food in other people's countries they quite naturally assume that we're a bunch of lunatics and don't know at all what we're talking about and Miguel who we'll meet later on came over and said look at those tomatoes you've got they're not at all happy you must have happy tomatoes so he took mine away and gave me his anyway back to the ingredients a big bowl of very fresh very ripe happy smiling tomatoes some tomato juice some cucumber cut into cubes some green pepper cut into little pieces like that, some onion chopped, some iced water, okay, then some red wine vinegar, olive oil, tarragon, salt, pepper, and lots of other little things. Now, at the end, when the whole thing is made, you garnish it with these things. Now, big close up on these, because they're very small. Finely chopped onion, finely chopped cucumber, and finely chopped red pepper and green pepper, and over here a little bit 
little croutons of bread fried in garlic. So that's what you need. But then to make it, and this is a holiday place and people like to enjoy themselves, so we thought we wouldn't be prissy like they do on those studio-based cooking programs where everything is done so carefully with weights and measures and rubber gloves and measuring sticks and the whole thing. We thought we'd make some real gazpacho in a bucket. And gazpacho is very easy to make. Now watch this. You throw the tomatoes in. OK, you put that there. You throw the cucumber in. Uh, back up to me just for a second. Everything is very precisely weighed, precisely measured. Thank you very much, Miguel. Onions go in, no problem. Thank you, Miguel. Great. Tomato ketchup, I mean tomato juice. Thank you, Miguel. A load of ice and water. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Excellent. Then you just throw in some wine vinegar. Quite a bit of that. You put in some olive oil, which is, of course, the, the cooking method of the region is always use olive oil. You put in some tarragon. Very careful. 18 leaves of tarragon, for those of you who want to be exactly precise. OK, 18 leaves of tarragon, 23 and a half grains of sugar, of a salt, I mean, not a problem at all, and 15 grains of the pepper mill. And finally, just a little bit of garlic. Then, this is the sort of thing you can do at home with the supervision of an adult, OK? It's very important, because you take your blender, it's like something out of a chainsaw massacre, OK, and you just go... Let me switch this damn thing off. It's more like an outboard motor than a blender. Listen, that's going to take about 15 minutes, so I'll get one of my team of home economists to do that, because, as you all know, I do none of this cooking myself. It's all done by experts in the background. Instead, we'll move over and meet my latest, greatest chum, Miguel, whose bar this is, and we're going to have a drink. We're very thirsty, it's very hot, it's holiday time in uh, where we are, Andalusia, and we need a drink. So we'll have yep. the famous and the classic sangria. We start with what? The ice. ice. OK, now the first thing is lots of ice. Happy well, ice? Very happy. Very happy very ice. Happy. Very important that things are happy when you're having a good time. Happy ice, right. Followed by some very happy Cointreau. <laughs> and you can make this happy as you like. The more you put in, the more happier the ice gets. Is that right, Cointreau? Uh, yeah, Excellent. Put, put the fruit down. And then we put the fruit in. Yeah. Right. This is finely chopped, lovely Spanish limes, lemons and oranges. Finely diced. That, that much? Is that yeah, fine? Yeah, it's OK. It's okay. That's happy, it's isn't okay. it? <laughs> That's quite happy. Then, the, to make it really happy, you get some banana, banana liqueur. liqueur. Now, this is Miguel's own special recipe. You might not have banana liqueur at home. You could use another liqueur. But he likes to put banana liqueur in it, and I like to add a little bit more than he normally does. <laughs> it's OK. Is that OK? Yeah. Right. Love then, brandy. a lovely Spanish brandy, 103. And we put a fair amount of that in. Is that OK? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that really happy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy. Very, very happy. Very, 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 very happy. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> then <laughs> some Andalusian wine. wine. <laughs> happy wine. Yeah. Time to okay, stir. It's okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Right. No, no, it's okay. A little bit of lemon. lemon. Then we have some fizzy lemon. Yeah. And a little bit okay. of orange. Juice. A little bit of orange. Yeah. And what we mustn't yeah. forget yeah. is some cinnamon. Yeah. Plop in some cinnamon. And the sugar. And the happy sugar. Uh, happy. Because Good. this is a very happy place. <laughs> and to make ourselves even more happy, you know, as a rest from grinding <laughs> up the gazpacho, we can cheer ourselves up with the classic drink of Andalusia, the classic drink of Spain, which is... Cheers. Cheers. Salud. Salud. Now, Clyde, if I can have a really one of your big, famous, fat close-ups on the soup bowl, I can just go over the finer points of the whole soup. You'll remember that I basically liquidised tomatoes with red peppers, green peppers and all that stuff and got that lovely soup there. But then I've garnished it with very finely chopped onion, finely chopped cucumber, finely chopped red peppers, green peppers and little croutons fried in olive oil and garlic. Well, that's fine. Back up to me, please. That's all very good. I'm pretty pleased with it, but it really depends on Miguel whether he thinks it's any good. Yeah, so, so what do you think of the gazpacho? Very good. Fantastic. Now, Sangria is... <clears throat> Nothing so. Yeah. Many people mistakenly think that flamenco is a signature tune for the whole of Spain. In fact, it's a deeply passionate expression of sadness and love from Andalusia's gypsy heart. This is Tormenes' version. Anyway, my musical knowledge is nil, so I invited my new chum, John Williams, to educate me. 
As a cook, you can tell the difference between the north and the south of the Mediterranean country. In the, in the north, it's butter cooking, and in, the, and in the south, it's olive oil cooking. Is there a musical comparison? Certainly. I mean, in Spain, I think that flamenco, whether it's good or bad or commercial or what you expect to find as a tourist, uh, is identified with Andalusia, you know, with southern Spain. <clears throat> but if you go to other parts of Spain, if you go to Galicia, up the northwest, you hear the bagpipes, you hear pipes and drums and things in the, uh, in the Basque country in Catalonia. Uh, every region has its very identifiable music, you know, and uh, it, one of the pities about the sort of Spanish uh, myth of, of music, I would say, is that it's only flamenco music, and of course it's not. It's, it's, it's a very traditional deep music of the deep south, the gypsies, you know, but it's, it's not the music of the whole of Spain. There are many other regions with beautiful folk songs, beautiful uh, dances and everything else. Wasn't that good? It's only a cookery pro you can see me right, anyway, yes. It's only a cookery program, you see. We don't often get people of the calibre of John Williams to give us a quick 30-second musical sketch. Brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> Malaga is like a rich layer cake. At its base, you have a nice chunky slice of Roman and Phoenician influence, a thick slab of Moorish culture, topped with an icing of Visigoth and Christian traditions. Quite delicious. Thanks, Clive. That's enough general views of Malaga. Let's get on with the cooking sketch. Malaga, apart from fine food, has other wondrous things to offer, and one of them is an aperitif called Malaga. It's a voluptuous, soft, fruity red wine made from the Moscatel grape and makes a splendid aperitif before you cook your lunch, which I'm about to do. It's a very simple dish, well known in this region, using sherry and prawns and ham. All things that are very, very Spanish. So if you'd like to have a quick spin around the ingredients, here they are. We have sherry and parsley, wonderful fresh prawns, mountain ham finely diced, finely chopped parsley, some mustard, some butter, and finally, the lingering look on those beautifully arranged prawns, some peeled prawns ready to cook. Lingered long enough? Thank you. Now, while you weren't here, I made a very simple white sauce. I melted some butter in a pan, added some flour, added some milk, made a smooth white sauce like this, Clive, and then I added some fish stock to it to give it a lovely, creamy, fishy flavour. To make it even more delicious, I'm going to add a little tiny bit, just put down here, a little bit of mustard into that as well. And we'll stir that in. Right, OK. Now, over here I've got the pan, so up on the pan, please, Clive some butter. If you hear lots of hissing and spluttering noises, it's because bits of rain are dropping. Oh, and butter's melting. Clive, do you know, it hasn't rained here for five months, and this is our first outdoor cooking sketch, and of course, it's tipping down. Anyway, never mind. Prawns go straight into there. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Lovely fresh prawns. Stay with it, Clive, please. We chuck in the ham straight away, like that. The parsley straight away. Sear them under this fierce heat. OK, and then whack a bit of sherry in. And let them bubble for a couple of moments. And now, there will be a small musical interlude. Back on the pot. on the cherry, Floyd. I, I just had a couple of glasses of the local red. You play it, I'll cook it, OK? Many have searched for and found peace and security in these mountains just a few miles from the crowded beaches of the Costa del Sol. And once upon a time, these Sierras were refuge for highwaymen and bandits. Now they are home to lots of people with electric gates and Dobermans, so things haven't changed that much. I'm sure John won't mind me talking over his music. Oh, he does. Ah, oh, shut up. While John is concentrating on this tricky bit, a few more gastronomic tips. Sorry to interrupt, but it is a cookery programme. Pomegranates grow in confusion, and there are figs, probably planted by the Arabs, as well as quinces, hard as nails, but when cooked, they make a wonderful aromatic jelly, delicious with cheese. 
and of course olives, which John Williams adores. And I didn't say if music be the food, you know, all that nonsense, but he is first class. Um, right, the sauce now goes into the prawns, like that. Okay, quick twiddle around. Don't forget, what I did, I fried the prawns in butter with finely chopped ham and parsley, and the mustard sauce with a fish stock goes on top of it, like that. Anyway, that was John's brilliant tribute to Malaga. This is my tribute to him. It's a Malaga dish of prawns and parsley and ham and sherry and milk and butter and I hope he likes it as much as I like his music. You know, after, when you're playing concerts all over the place, you, you tend to eat and go for it after the concert in the evening, you know. So this for lunchtime is unbelievable. And by you, I mean, I can dine out on this, you know, <laughs> whatever, I mean, cooked lunch by Floyd, my God. This is wonderful though. This, what, what, I mean, what, this is fantastic. What it is, very simply, you were too busy twanging your guitar to notice what I mm. would actually do. I, mean, I was working really hard while you were doing that, I'll have you know. It's fresh well, shrimps. I heard you say sherry, I remember yeah. that, but. Well, fresh shrimps fried in butter with very finely chopped mountain ham, parsley, flames and a little sherry, and then with mm. a light fish white sauce poured over, a little bit of mustard just to give it a bit of tang. But listen, when you're not playing guitar, do you cook? I do. I mean, I'm not by no means a, you know, a fine, I don't do special things, but I love it. I love uh, mucking around the kitchen. I call it mucking around the kitchen, not really cooking. But no, I really do. I try bits of curry and fish in the oven and things like that. All the easy things. But, you know, I could, perhaps if I could remember bits of this. Fantastic. Go ahead. Wonderful. It won't ah. make you fat, I promise. No, it won't, no. And even if it did, I wouldn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually worry about it that much, no. Anyway, John, the music was fabulous. And I promise you, this won't make you fat. And the checks in the post. And I look forward to the next one. <laughs> Cheers, I've been. Cheers. Thanks. God bless you. Fantastic. Picasso's early inspiration might well have come from one of these wonderful bars where they serve not sherry, but Malaga wines, traditionally grown from the Pedro Jimenez grape, but today mixed with other varieties. The tastes vary from pleasantly dry to seriously sweet, but the atmosphere is superb. After a glass or two, even three, with the odd tapas of prawn and mussels and squid, you can spend a brilliantly inexpensive evening in a bar that hasn't changed for a couple of centuries. Where Pablo Picasso at the turn of the century, as a young man probably came with his chums. Glass of rich Malaga wine in one hand and a piece of chalk in the other. Might have pondered the revolutionary handling of space and form, which the world would come to know as cubism. Well, might have. Bars are my downfall, but fresh air and exercise in the cool Sierra Nevada is essential for getting rid of the excesses of too much Malaga wine. The hills are alive with an erratic heartbeat and a thumping head. There are lots of these little villages that grow like clusters of wild mushrooms on the slopes of the Sierra Nevada. Many of these were formed by people who, way back some 500 years ago, wanted to escape religious persecution. So they came to the safety of the mountains to plant their crops and raise their children. They were Arabs, of course, who, having dominated the country for 700 years, were reluctant to leave it. The bakery here is as old as the village itself, and the method for making the bread hasn't changed in all that time. There's been no need to. It's doughy, delicious flavor derived from the chestnuts, pines, and olive wood that fires the oven. As they say, to know a country, you must eat a country. Once it was the Visigoths' arrows that threatened these villages. Now it's holiday complexes and the high prices for second homes that pose the greatest danger. How long will the red peppers dry in the morning sun and the fowl be fattened for the rich dishes of the mountain folk before tourism wreaks its terrible toll? Wasn't that really interesting? History and food, geography, they're all intermingled. They're inseparable, like horses and carriages, love and marriage and all that stuff. But cycling is an exhilarating sport, and it also makes you very, very hungry. And I'm starving, and there are no supermarkets around here up in the mountains in Sierra Nevada. And I haven't, you might think I have, but I haven't got a caravan towing behind me with hot and cold running gin and tonics and nice snacks and things in it. I have to take with me what I can carry in my pack. 
And also, apart from that, things are a little bit difficult this morning, just between you and me and all of you watching. Clive isn't very well. He's hurt his back. So I'm doing a very gentle mountain boy's breakfast for him. So when I've cooked it, of the typical products you can get here in the mountains, which are, Clive, come down to the pot, you can manage it, mind your back, steady. Lovely mountain bacon, garlic, red peppers, sizzling away in wonderful olive oil. And then I'll lift these to you, Clive. Come back up to me, because I know it hurts you to lift the camera. It's very heavy on his shoulder, you know. Wonderful mountain sausages, the black ones and the red ones. This is slightly spicy, this is very porky. And all they do is go into there and sizzle away for a little while. Now, all this talk, all this sucking, as I said, has made me terribly thirsty. And right here, I happen to have a little drop of the local plonk. So I'll have a quick slurp. Oh dear. Mm. Probably what will happen, I expect at some time, because we've had a very busy morning, we'll probably have a little cutaway and maybe do some more history, because I know you're very keen on history. I really love it. Anyway, back onto the pot, please, Clive, because I happen to have here a jar of preserved beans, haricot beans. So we just pop those into there, if we can get them out. We'll stir around. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? Wonderful colours of the Sierra Nevada. A simple mountain breakfast. Now, Clive, that has to cook away for about 20 minutes. I need to put the lid on it. I need to talk to you about more food and history and how they're linked together. So I shall do a really good thought piece in a minute. In the meantime, you give us one of those super GVs. And by the way, people at home, by the time you see this programme, Clive will be better. So don't bother to send him any get well cards. For a refreshing mid-morning snack, the fruit from the prickly pear cactus, handled with expert care, the pink flesh is quite succulent. And then there's chestnuts. They do great things up here with them, with wild mushrooms and game. Incidentally, the wood for the little flat-roofed white houses comes from the chestnut trees. The valleys with the soft climate are wonderful for growing vegetables of all kinds, especially beans, which brings me very neatly to lunch. Anyway, I've done lots of chat. I want to show you this superbly simple dish. Quick, spin round the ingredients, Clive, and we'll cook it straight away in real time, OK? It basically it has beans, which have been blanched in boiling water, so they're half cooked. It has the wonderful ham from Serrano or Salamanca. It has salt, it has eggs, it has prawns, it has garlic, and it has olive oil. And what I have, while I pause for breath, because that was a pretty dynamic take, I have a quick slurp. OK. The very first thing we do, pan on the stove, straight in. Now over here, Clive, please, thank you. A little bit of garlic in there. Get that sizzling, just for a few seconds. Then we pop in these wonderful prawns. They go straight into the pot. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Very straight forward. Then we chuck in a few of these blanched beans. OK, this is only for about one person, a little starter for one person. OK, then a little bit of the ham, ham on, like so. A quick swizzle round. This is very hot, very fast cooking. It's, the whole thing only takes a couple of seconds. Back up to be just one second, though, Clive, because it is... See, what they do in these programmes, they switch off the vent axes and things, so I get very, very hot. And a little refreshing slurp cools the temperature, cools the pace, and lets things happen in their proper way. Now, the other important part of this dish are three well-beaten whole eggs, that's the yellows and the whites. And of course, one of the, come back to me please, Clive, one of the good things about Spanish cooking is they do believe in things like free-range eggs, fresh vegetables, fresh fish, simplicity, yes, but freshness is all. Freshness is paramount. Right, now, we pop those into there and just shir them round, as the Americans would say, for a second. On the gas here. And this is quite a running dish. It's not an omelette. It's really... You know, back up to me, Clive. You know, in those posh brasseries you go to, for breakfast it says, have scrambled eggs and smoked salmon on a bit of toast and a glass of champagne or Buck's Fizz or something like that. Well, this is the Spanish and rather nicer version of that kind of thing. And look, as we speak, there it is. Absolutely ready. Now, stay there for two seconds while I get from the hot cupboard over here my little plate. And there we are. There's a little bit of fresh, friendly, sunny Andalusia on a plate. A cracking little snack. A brunch, a lunch, a supper for lovers, a treat.
One of my ambitions, the sort of thing I really want to do before I'm forced to grow up, is to take off for the month with only a horse for company in these wild mountains, breakfasting on freshly caught trout, gathering wild mushrooms, sleeping under the stars, drinking only chilled water from mountain streams. That's more or less what my latest chum, Dallas Love, does. She moved here some 20 years ago from England, fell in love with the Sierras and made them her home. Her closest neighbor is a shepherd who looks like a character from The Sun Also Rises. Unfortunately, he had a few too many glasses at lunchtime and mislaid his flock, temporarily, of course. And now, supper. The rabbits and the pheasants and the grouse and the partridge and the sheep, only lives up here, taste particularly good because it eats wonderful wild herbs, wonderful grasses and things, and it breathes clear mountain air, which is good for all of us. That's why I'm so excited. Anyway, I've got in here some rabbit chopped up into little bits, frying away in olive oil with onions, ham and garlic. And maintaining that community style, the mountain theme in these herbs, if you would just get your size 11s back a bit, because you're stepping in my herb garden. Isn't this good? Fresh thyme, beautifully perfected by the sun, growing at my feet. So I put a nice bunch of thyme into the, into the rabbit. Right, back again, please. Thank you. Right, thyme into there. Then, what we'd also hope to find while we're here with this new season's wild mushrooms. But typically, the weather's been wonderful. It hasn't rained for five months, and we're two weeks ahead of schedule. So I went to my friendly hotel. I said, hey, can you help me out? Have you got any of last year's mushrooms? I said, yes, we have. We've got some preserved in olive oil. They're absolutely splendid. They're wild mushrooms from the mountains. They go into the pine trees, and you just tip them in with the rabbit like that. OK, now this is going to take, back to me, please, guys. You can get a nice fat closer to that later, OK? Because I'm, you know, it's getting on, it's getting cold, and I want to get back to the pub. Right, all right. This will take about, oh, half an hour or more to simmer away. But one of the little things I've learnt while I've been in Spain is that to thicken their sauces, they sometimes grind up almonds. Now, this is a legacy of the Moors who used to be around this part of the world a great deal. And sometimes they use the liver of the beast they're actually cooking. In this instance, I've mashed the liver right up of the rabbit, so it's almost a puree, and that will go into this pot, and it'll cook away, and when I next add, I'm going to do straight away some lovely red wine. The liver will help to make a thick, rich sauce to go with the rabbit, the wild mushrooms, the mountain herbs, and in fact, you know, this really is an authentic but quite spontaneous Sierra Nevada dish. Have a look at the sunset. Or actually, Clive wanted me to point out to you that there isn't a sunset tonight. It's a bit cloudy, and he's a bit unhappy about the background because it's not as brilliant as he'd like it would be. But we can't change the weather. We're only cooks. In fact, it was frustrating both for Clive and for us and for you because normally from here you can see the coast of North Africa, but you'll have to be content with this horse's bottom instead. Anyway, after about another 20 minutes or so, the dish was ready. The tangy rabbit and the gravy thickened by the liver gave it a rich, gamey flavour. It was quite superb. Alice, would you like to try a bit? I'd be delighted to. Tell me what you think. Incidentally, this is how they eat up here in the mountains. Put the stuff in a big pot, nobody sits around it and shares a... Mm. It's delicious. Is it really? Absolutely delicious. What would your Spanish chums think of this? Would they? I think they'd be quite impressed with it. I mean, they're very fond of rabbit, but they don't normally do it with these type of mushrooms. And I think they would like it very much. I certainly do. It's mm. very good. Other lady we're leaving in the programme. It's good, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. we have to wait at the mouth if they don't like it. But listen, isn't it like a bit... Hello. I'll admit it, I'm a terrible interviewer. I'm too easily distracted by flavours, smells and brilliant countryside. And sometimes when I cook on television, the dish doesn't turn out exactly as I wanted it to. But this one, with the rabbit, the wild mushrooms and the wine, was brilliant. Earthy, gamey and one of the best things I've ever cooked. Sometimes you just don't need words.